What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today our guest is the CEO of CrossFit, Don Fall. We talked to him extensively about what it's like to run one of the biggest fitness companies in the world, how his love for rugby and reading informs his outlook as a leader, about all his experience at Stanford and the Marines, at tech companies like Google and Meta and Pinterest, and ultimately how he wants to get CrossFit back on track after some hurdles, after some stumbles in recent years and really take them to where he thinks they should be over the next decade when we talk about the 2030s, what this company is ultimately going to mean to American culture, to global culture. So without further ado, let's get into that conversation. But first, a quick word from our partners over at NetSuite. The year 2000, 2008, 2022. When it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. You got the dot com crash, the housing crash, whatever roller coaster it is that we're going through right now. Only one thing is certain it's a dangerous time to not know your numbers. But over 31,000 businesses don't have that problem because they have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite's going to give you the visibility and control over your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting that you need so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and ultimately improve improve those margins. Everything you need, all in one place. You're trying to prepare for uncertain times? Easy answer, NetSuite. This will help you identify rising costs, automate your business processes, easily see where to save money. 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgrade it to NetSuite. So what are you waiting for? In fact, right now is the perfect time. NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you have to do is head to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion once again, netsuite.com slash my other passion is super easy. Head there and just see how things start to take a turn for the better. Netsuite.com slash my other passion. Now back to the show. What's up, Don? Welcome to the podcast. Nice to see you this morning. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So uh, where are you coming from today? So I am uh, calling in from a little town called Woodside, which is about a half hour south of San Francisco. All right. Nice. Yeah, I'm a... I'm a big fan of the Bay Area. I'm down in LA and you know, I try to get up there when I can. You have you been there for a long time? Like this is a long yeah, time home base? Here. Yeah, I grew up on the East Coast, but uh, after college ended up uh when I was in the Marine Corps getting stationed in San Diego and kind of fell in love with the West Coast at that point. And then I moved up here to the Bay Area in two thousand four and have lived here since. Nice. Well, congrats on uh, this new chapter in your career. I know you're you're now the CEO of CrossFit. Um, you know, one thing that I that I noticed when when I read, you know, your company's announcement about it or anything out in the in the public about it, a lot of people would reference he has this this eight years of experience with CrossFit. And I assume that's just like as a consumer, you go to CrossFit gyms, you know about the boxes, you know about the lifestyle. And I'm wondering, it's such a it's such a jump, right? I mean, props to you for just going in, understand how it works on the ground level, now being at the helm of the company. How do you think knowing things from a consumer and a personal standpoint can help you with like this, this overarching executive vision? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's been enormously helpful and important, I guess, on two dimensions. You know, the first is, you know, I, I discovered CrossFit back in 2014, uh, kind of fell in love with it pretty quickly. And it's been a big part of my life since. And so you know, for the past eight years, I've gotten a chance to experience CrossFit personally. Um, it has had a huge impact on my life, on my health, on my fitness. Uh, it's connected me to a bunch of folks uh, who are now really close friends of mine. And I've seen it do the same for hundreds, probably thousands of other people in the box that I go to and in the dozens of boxes I've visited all over the country. Um, and so having that background and context has been just really, really important and helpful in seeing you know, uh, people whose lives have been changed, um, you know, in, in their local CrossFit box, people of every age, every background, every level of fitness. So bringing that context in, I think it's been super helpful. And, you know, I guess the other, the other way that, that I think that experience has been really helpful is just, you know, what I think CrossFit has done for me, uh, and what it does for a lot of people. CrossFit is, um, you know, I tell a lot of folks, it, it can be humbling. You know, it is, you walk into the box for the first time, actually walk into the box any day and, you know, you are going to be challenged. And I think that's what draws a lot of people. And in that um, uh, humbling experience comes growth. 
And so, you know, I think for, for folks who do CrossFit, the benefits aren't just physical in terms of your level of fitness, but you also learn grit, you learn perseverance, you, wanna, you learn what it means to be part of a community. And so I think on both those dimensions, it's been so helpful. Right. I mean, you're coming into a company that that needs, you know, a vision for the future, needs someone to guide them there. And it's going to you're going to hit some bumps. You know, it's going to be it's going to be challenging. There will be elements where that grit is necessary. So it seems like, you know, if you can learn it in one place, you can apply it in another. Exactly. Exactly. I you know, I've got uh, three little kids and, and I tell them all the time that, you know, in life, adversity is important. And learning how to deal with the diversity and learn, learning how to overcome adversity. I think sport is an incredible way to do that. It's been that the case for me. And as you know, I think as as you know, as my kids grow up, I want to make sure that they get exposed to adversity and learn how to deal with it. And I think CrossFit does that for a lot of people. What do you look at that you feel like you almost immediately want to have an impact on whether it's just directly changing or evolving. I mean, you've been in the gym for like close <laughs> to a decade, right? And so I'm sure as much as you've loved it, there's been things that you're like, hmm, I wonder if this could be better. I wonder if we could approach things that way. Now you get the opportunity to enact that. You know, are there are there any yeah. things that immediately you hit the ground and you said, look, uh, this is this this brand is close to my heart and I know that this would help it. Yeah, you know, I think the first thing that absolutely jumps out is, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, un until you've experienced CrossFit, I think there's a lot of folks who have misperceptions that, hey, you know, you've got to be really fit to do CrossFit or, or hey, maybe I see these athletes lifting really heavy weights and, and, you know, can it be dangerous? And the truth is, if you experience it, you know, if you've had the opportunity to do CrossFit, you've seen, like I have, people of every age, every fitness level, folks who are recovering from injury, folks who have metabolic disease, folks who are, you know, over 65 years old. Um, you've seen their lives change through it. You've seen the community welcome them. You've seen them achieve things they never thought were possible. And yet all of these misperceptions still exist. Um, you know, we've been fortunate with CrossFit to touch millions of people, but the opportunity is so much bigger than that. And so I, you know, I think back about my own experience and say, gosh, like I am, if, you know, we have got to figure out how we do a better job of helping more people realize that CrossFit can be for them, that CrossFit can be for anyone. If you want to get fit, if you want to get healthier and you're willing to work hard, CrossFit's for you, period. So that's a huge, huge part of our focus. That was, it's funny you mentioned that because I was, I was wondering you know, as part of your idea to, and maybe it's a bit of both, but it does seem like there's this archetype of like who a CrossFit person is, right? And it's a little bit intimidating to a lot of people. And it's kind of like, maybe hard to break out into other demographics than what you're used to. Um, do you want to lean into feeding those core users, the people who, you know, every bit of research that I did, there's just, there's a community of people who've clearly been going for decades and, and like are obsessed with every facet of it. And they have so many suggestions. They have so much feedback and it made me think, okay, wow, like this group is, is, is hungry. Like they need to be fed. They need to be managed and cared for. Um, but at the same time, I was like, look, it's a business and you're a CEO. And I can only imagine you know, you'd like this to be a little more mainstream. Like, do, does CrossFit survive the next decade with everyone thinking, oh, yeah, that's that's for CrossFit guys. Like, I can't do this, you know, because cause it, it probably has a bit of that right now. And, like, ultimately, how do you break through that? And what do you think is, like, more important to the company, doubling down on your core or, or trying to break through and say, like, look, a whole new class of people who probably never thought CrossFit for them – we, we market differently. We message differently to let them know that there is an opening. Well, I think that the good news for us is I think there's a lot of businesses who face constraints around growth where they're forced to rethink the offering or the experience and say, hey, we have to change this to attract new people because what we built doesn't work for this audience in which we want to grow. In our case, that's fundamentally not the case. The good news is for us. Literally, this is a perception and brand challenge for us. You know, you walk into the box, CrossFit, you know, it's infinitely scalable, we say. Um, I don't care what level of fitness, again, what age you are, you can walk into a box tomorrow morning and you can do the workout. And there is a coach there and a community there that is ready to welcome you and support you. And so for us, I don't think it's about this trade-off between do we give up our core and service of this future? 
It's actually about doubling down on what we already have and figuring out how we do a better job of lifting those stories that people have seen firsthand and getting them in front of people who have these misperceptions. And so that is a really, really big part of what we're going to, you know, we've already started to focus on this year and we'll be doubling down on next year is let's elevate those stories. Let's show people what's already happening in the tens of thousands of boxes around the world. So you're really new to this position. You started what at the top of August. Um, That's right. So, so what have these first, you know, few weeks, couple months been like, what are, what are you doing? How does someone assume a CEO position and then come in and hit the ground running? Like, you know, a lot of it, I, I mean, I know anybody could probably relate from starting a new job. Part of it is learning, right? You got to get in and get a late for the land. But for sure. I know that, you know, the patience, I would imagine with a CEO is a little different because it's like there's this expectation. You come in, you change things, you make things better. And so, like, what's your experience been like trying to get that ball rolling? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I think I'm about five weeks, maybe six weeks in now. My first week, I was I've been kind of joking. I had the best first week of work in the history of work. It was at the CrossFit Games, actually. And so nice. I got to see, you know, this incredible community meet a ton of affiliate owners, CrossFitters. So really the focus for me has been, I've been trying to focus in kind of three core areas. And, and a lot of that's been grounded in what I'm seeing and hearing as I talk to folks in our community. The first, first to your point is just really about learning. I have a lot of opinions and perspectives as an individual member of the community for the last eight years. Um, but, but I also recognize there is so much for me to learn. And so I've been spending a lot of time with our team. I've been spending a lot of time with folks in our community, affiliate owners, other CrossFitters, partners who have been around for a while that have a really interesting and compelling point of view. And really just trying to take all of those conversations and, and synthesize them into a set of kind of themes that hopefully represent opportunities for us to kind of build on. Uh, the second thing I've been working on is, um, you know, in the short term, jumping in where I can to support the team, support the community in the short term with decisions. And so, um, you know, weighing in on kind of where we are, some decisions we need to make going into to the end of the year, into next year, uh, trying to be in service to supporting the team. And then the last area I think is, is, is probably the most important, um, which is working on with, with our team uh, and with input from the community on a long-term vision and strategy for CrossFit. One of the things that I've heard most consistently from everyone I talk to uh, inside and outside the company is, hey, we need clarity in where we're going. Um, you know, we are, CrossFit is a community and we're super lucky to have tens of thousands of super passionate box owners, millions of CrossFitters, partners who want to and expect to be a part of kind of this journey and growing the community. And, you know, uh, every conversation I've had with those folks, they've asked for, hey, we want to help. But we need to know where we're going, you know, and we expect that from HQ. We expect that from CrossFit. And so uh, we've been working on, I've been working with our leadership team, with folks on our team, with input from um, from the community on, hey, where do we want to be in 2030? So well, early years, days, early days, but where do you want to be? Like, like, what's the rough sketch, you know, a few weeks into your yeah. tenure? Yeah, so I'd say that, you know, what, what's crystal clear is kind of true north for us is um, reaching more people. Um, how do we impact more lives around the world? So, you know, if you look at roughly today, we're in probably the low single digit millions. If you look at kind of approximate the number of people who actively do CrossFit, again, we have something that we know could be for anyone. So we want to be, you know, multiples of that, um, reaching people in um, every country around the world, um, having the exact same, same type of impact that we're having today, making sure we don't dilute the experience, if anything, make it better. Uh, and then if you look at the overall size of the community, if we do that well, if we nail that, which I'm super confident we can, there's a much bigger pie for everyone. We've got more boxes. The boxes are more successful. Partners are successful. Our team is more successful. All those folks who we touch, most importantly, um, their lives have changed. So that is the true north. And then everything we are doing is, okay, if that's where we want to be, we've set kind of a number internally. Um, hey, we want to be here eight years from now. How do we get there and how do we focus on the right things in the short, medium and long run? And then how do we enlist the other folks in the ecosystem to work alongside us to make that a reality? So 2030, I love that you're thinking like that. I bring this up in so many episodes here. I'm a big futurist. I'm a big like, where are we going to be in 2030? Just because 
now as uh, you know, a young man, we were talking about our kids and stuff uh, before we hopped on recording. It's like I'm just very in touch with the fact of how fast it goes. It, it's going to be 2030 like pretty soon because Lord knows it was just 2014, right? Um, so I think probably the first thing that comes to mind just as an outsider, if I'm going to think about the future of a business like CrossFit, is is the digital threat or at least reality right um we saw it a lot in the early days of the pandemic now it's an interesting time to have this convo because it's a roller coaster Pan peloton was supposed to be the thing that changed everything will anyone ever go back to the gym now that stock is almost worthless you know like john foley co-founders out like sales are down everything has changed um you know i see stuff like Planet Fitness is having a huge return, right, of people coming to the gyms. But at the same time, you got the most valuable company in the world in Apple, who is tripling down on what their watches can do for fitness, on what their Apple Fitness offering is. Um, you got Equinox, who's kind of straddling and playing in both. There's a lot of competition, not just with other gyms, like, you know, maybe the first half of this company's life was. Now your phone, your everything, just hop on YouTube and do a quick 15-minute workout. I mean, there's so much competition. There always has been in fitness, but now you're opening up across mediums. What does CrossFit do to to succeed in the face of that? Um, do you feel like you want to stay rooted in what you're doing in physical space because you know the digital stuff comes and goes do you feel like you have to play with the apples of the world like you know that's got to be part of the 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 10 year eight year vision uh and i love your perspective on it yeah absolutely um you know and what i'd say here is our strategy is um to, to continue to stay focused on what has got us to where we are today which is delivering a, a the fitness experience that has the biggest possible impact uh, on people's health and fitness. And, you know, having, I, I you know, uh, being in this space, um, I've been an athlete, you know, uh, largely a roughly mediocre athlete most of my life, but I love this space and I've tried everything. There is nothing that works as well as CrossFit, period, full stop. And if you look at the, at the results of folks who stick to it and commit it, they're healthier, they have better outcomes, they're generally happier. Um, and so for us in the long run, our approach to competition is to stay focused on what matters, especially in an industry candidly, where there's a lot of snake oil and BS and empty promises and flashes in the pans and fads. And we think the experiences in the companies ultimately in the long run that have the largest success are those that deliver the best results, um, to their customers. And so. You know, now what does that mean? You know, to your point, the world's changed a lot. And I think we have to be really thoughtful and mindful of, of how do we best support our community in a world in which um, what it means to go to work, what it means to, to stay at home has changed and evolved a ton. And I think COVID has been a really interesting ride where we've, we've learned quite a bit. You know, I think on the front end of COVID, you know, for me, I remember when our office closed, first thing I did was go to Rogue uh, and, and try to buy a bunch of dumbbells. Um, and, you know, I try to figure out how do I experience fitness from home? Um, and we've got my wife and I have a Peloton and we have a bunch of different stuff. And early on, I really enjoyed the flexibility of being able to walk out to the garage and get a real good workout in. But, but then I, and I think a lot of people experienced the longer the pandemic went on, the more we realized actually there was something missing that that working out by yourself, whether it's in your garage or in your basement, in your living room, is just fundamentally not the same. Um, I think fitness is human beings are social creatures. We need community. We need connection. And there's just no substitute from having other people around you to motivate you, to challenge you, to support you, to push you in terms of what you get out of this fitness experience. And that's why we've seen, you know, like Lifetime, we've seen a huge return to our physical spaces, to our boxes over the course of the past year because people are missing it. They're missing that connection. And they have a better experience when they can work out and train with other people. And so I think the future of this is, you know, we need to be thoughtful. I think the future of fitness is hybrid. It's going to be largely physical, but we're going to need to provide the flexibility where if you're working from home that day, um, you can walk out to your garage, grab a pair of dumbbells and get a great workout. And the next day, show up at your box and reconnect with your community. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that in person's back uh, as far as gyms are concerned, like, I, and I'm not even 
one of those like social gym people. Like I don't I might say hi to a few people I see recurrently, but I'm in there to focus and do what I need to do. But I'll tell you to be in that community, people who I am seeing week in and week out. It's like, okay, we're all here. It's almost like we don't even have to say a word to be accountability partners. And, um, exactly. and yeah, I like that a lot. Well, I'm wondering, uh, I would love to talk a bit about these athlete days that you mentioned, but but take us to before then, because I know you went to the Naval Academy. Uh, you were also in the Marines. Um, how did how did those experiences shape you? Almost what is just, you know, I think I think you could probably talk a whole episode just, just about the Naval Academy and Marines. But but what is it the thing that you probably find most in your life now so far removed from it in some ways that has stuck with you? and prepared you for life? Yeah, I, I think there's, um, you know, a few things that really come to mind. And, you know, I'm so grateful for that experience, you know, getting a chance to, to, to serve and be around other men and women. Um, what I learned as an individual, what I learned about leadership. You know, the first thing was, um, I, you know, I think my time in the military was the first time I really, really learned how to deal with adversity. You know, and, and a huge part philosophically of how the services prepare you is they put you through a whole host of challenges where the deck is stacked against you and you can't win. And through that, and in partnership with the other folks around you, you learn what it means to be a part of a team. You learn what it means to deal with challenges and setbacks. And, you know, life is, if if, if you're lucky, you know, life is a series of setbacks that you can overcome. And so um, every job I've had since I look back and, and think, gosh, there's nothing I've faced you know, at Facebook, at Pinterest, at Google, that, that came close to the adversity that we had to work through um, when I was in the Marine Corps. So I, I think that's a that's a huge piece of it. Um, the second is, you know, being around a, a group of men and women who were entirely purpose driven. You know, nobody signs up in, for the Marine Corps to make a lot of money. You know, people sign up for and they they spend time in the service because they believe in something bigger than themselves. They believe in a purpose and a mission. Um, uh, and, and work towards it collectively. And for me, getting a chance to experience that was, was a real privilege and see folks who came from all across this country, all sorts of different backgrounds, all unified around one common focus and purpose. Gosh, what a privilege that was. And I think a lot about that as I think about the type of culture that, you know, I, I tried to create in my per- previous roles and, and the culture we have at CrossFit. If we can create something similar, you know, we've got this incredible opportunity to reach and touch a lot of people. How do I draw on those lessons? And that brings me, I guess, to the, the, the third piece is, um, you know, what I learned about leadership. And, you know, there are a few places where as a, in my case, as a 21 or 22 year old, they give you a chance to actually manage and lead people. And I didn't know what the heck I was doing, um, you know, somewhat trial by fire. But the Marine Corps has this servant leader approach and philosophy towards leadership. You know, as an officer, as a leader, you um, uh, you know, and you learn really early on that your job is to actually work for your people, not vice versa. Your job is to support them. And so there are little rituals in the Marine Corps, like the leaders always eat last. They make sure the Marines eat first. And, you know, when you're out in the field, you sleep in the dirt next to your Marines. There isn't a separate place for the leaders. And you clean your weapons just like everyone else. And you take a shift on on Firewatch like everybody else. And that mentality, I am so grateful for. And, you know, it's something that I try really hard to espouse and and create in the leadership culture of the organizations I've been a part of. I've always loved that approach to leadership across everything. Like you should be able to do and know how to do everything the intern is doing. Like, you know, like, yes, maybe you elevate beyond it and that's not your day to day, but you shouldn't be like, Oh, you know, I came in I'm just some executive getting paid a bunch. I don't know what's going on. So love, love that approach. Um, makes me think of FOS. Cause it's like, you know, we all, everyone should know how to send our newsletters, how to, you know, write a feature, write an article. And it's just, yeah, it's something that you can apply across everything. What is, what is one of those uh, military or Marines specifically, uh, like challenges where things were stacked against you? Like I see stuff on TikTok and it's like, they're carrying bricks underwater and like crazy stuff like that, that I see. And I'm like, oh my God. I wouldn't last. Um, any any one that sticks out to you that you're just like, man, no, nah, they tested us with this, and you know, I was, I had a different <laughs> outlook on life and and what I can accomplish once I got through it. Yeah, I think thematically, one of the 
one of the things that, you know, in the military you try to build into training is, is testing people at their limits. And so, you know, when you are most tired, when you are most frustrated. And so, you know, we would regularly do training where they would restrict the amount of sleep you got. They'd restrict how much you could eat. They would push you on really long, physical, stressful. They would change things last minute. And we used to talk about, they used to say, hey, don't go internal. And what that meant was, you know, when you're suffering, when you're hurting, um, the more tired you get, you have this tendency to just put blinders on and think about yourself. Gosh, I'm so exhausted right now. I just want, I, I can't do anything but think about the next time I get to sleep. And learning how to keep those blinders off, especially as a leader and learning how to think about and put other people first was so important um, and lift other people up. That's another thing you learn. Like everybody has a bad moment. Everybody has a time when they get let the sleep deprivation um, or frustration get to them and being able to kind of have each other's backs and lift people up, you know, comes back to a lot. Like it's one of the things I love about CrossFit when you're suffering, there's always somebody there to kind of cheer you on, even if you're the last person working to, to finish the workout. So then moving on to like some of the next phases of your career, you go out to the Bay Area, uh, you're at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And then also you have this like run of tech companies that you mentioned, Google, Facebook, Pinterest. Um, what what were those experiences like? Um, of course, you know, I'm sure there's some ways that they prepare you for CrossFit, but just, you know, you, you have you've lived an interesting life, had an interesting like career track. Um, what did you find that those like, you know, big, cool companies that are kind of aspirational for a lot of people? What was it like on the inside for you? Also, same deal with like, you know, university, both your, both your, your grad school and then like your tech companies that you're at after are among like the most desirable places to study or work in the world. And so, you know, what did that teach you? And, and what was your experience there? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing is, um, you know, really reinforcement for me, like there is a thing, such thing as luck and serendipity. And, you know, I had the, I have had for a good part of my career, the biggest case of imposter syndrome and anxiety. So, you know, 2004, I'm getting out of the Marine Corps. Um, I've done nothing, but I've spent the last 10 years on active duty. I haven't spent a day of my life working in a normal job in business showed up at grad school where everyone around me is coming from these big name companies doing strategy, et cetera. Fast forward, going to Google, my first job there. I had not spent a single day of my life working in technology. I'm going in supposed to manage and lead people. And I only got those opportunities, you know, you know, did, did I work hard? Yeah, I did my best. But in each case, there is a serendipitous story of someone who is willing to do something for me where I had a unique opportunity. And so I always think about that because um, it keeps you grounded. And, and I try to do my best of like, if I have an opportunity to like create one of those serendipitous moments for somebody else, gosh, I'm going to do it. Somebody who has a non-traditional background, who is willing to work hard and hustle. And so that was a really big thing for me. You know, I think the second learning, I, I guess, is um, you just can't discount the importance and value of working really hard and being a great teammate. I remember we used to have this professor at Stanford who we were going off to our internships at companies that we hoped would lead to future opportunities. And, you know, you spend all your time, all our time in grad school, we would talk about different business stuff. And he said, you know, my biggest point of advice is just be a great teammate. And I remember thinking to myself, gosh, that's so simplistic. But looking back on it now, you know, I, I can do the best people I've ever worked with. What's the common denominator? Were they the smartest? Not necessarily. Did they go to the best undergrad institutions? Nope. They worked really hard and they put other people before themselves and they were a great teammate. And, and so, you know, that's something naively, you know, when I was coming out of the Marine Corps, I would have kind of scoffed at, but um, that really, for me, um, is something that I take a lot away from. And, you know, as I think now, again, about being in a place, if I can create those opportunities and who do I bet on? I'm going to bet on the folks who really hustle and the folks who, who are great, great teammates. Wise words. Well, you have, um, you have a lot of great experience between school, between these other companies, between, you know, Naval Academy, Marine Corps, um, and bringing us back to CrossFit, you get to be in this position where you can apply a lot of those learnings. And I think, you know, what's fascinating for me is, um, 
I think I think most people in pop culture, um, in business, like we love we love a comeback story. We love like the idea of just like you said, like facing adversity. Not only is it something that you need to build for your character because you're going to need it in life, like we both tell our kids. Um, there's just also like a entertainment factor. Maybe not if you're the person going through it, but but no one wants to watch sports or watch a movie or something without some element of grit and determination and comeback. And, um, you know, that's the position that you're in with, with CrossFit. I mean, I think with most people, we know it's this world renowned, world renowned fitness brand. Uh, we, we have our ideas about the type of people that go there. And a lot of them are really positive because they're super fit. They're super in shape. You know, I need to go so I can get my eight pack going. Like, you know, there's a lot of love for like, the, the the health and the fitness and uh, kind of like just like discipline that CrossFit brings. Um, but then that is sort of upended in a way in 2020 when, you know, former CEO Greg Glassman, he has these comments. They are insensitive. They're racist. There's backlash. Like all of a sudden it was surprising to me just, you know, removed from the situation because I'd only ever heard people talk about how much CrossFit changed their life and, hey, you should come to this class with me, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, you know, the conversation takes a shift. Uh, we're a couple years later from all of that happening. Greg is no longer with the company. You're here in its place. Um, what do you feel like is almost like the shock waves of that or the reverberations of that? Um you know, from a number standpoint, are you seeing recovery? Are people who left the gym seemingly starting to come back? And then just like perception wise, like you have to build trust up again with the public and everything. And like, what has that been like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's no question that, you know, 2020, you know, as you articulate, and then candidly two years of COVID had a huge impact on, on our community, on affiliate owners, on members. It, it was a really, really hard time. And, you know, we are, we're starting to see, um, for sure, um, you know, momentum coming out of that. Our, our growth has been really strong, both, both amongst affiliates um, and uh, CrossFitters getting back in the gym. And, you know, what I'll say in kind of reflecting on that is I think there's, there are some really important lessons for us. Like, Look, you know, no company, no, no, no person's path is perfectly up and to the right ever, right? The, the, the most historic businesses in history have their bumpy moments. And, um, you know, any organization, any teams like that sports team, same thing. Like you said, that's part of what makes the outcomes great. And I think what's really important in that, you know, the, the institutions, teams, organizations that succeed are the ones that learn from those moments that get stronger on the back of it. And, you know, that that's the kind of conviction that we bring. And I think what we've learned, what we learned looking back on that was, you know, one, what was really unfortunate, I think, about what went down was if you zoom out and talk to most folks who have been a part of the CrossFit community, who have walked into boxes all over the country, I think most folks would tell you, and I'm out there talking to people all the time, that it's one of the most welcoming and inclusive communities you'll meet. Um, and so it was a real bummer that, you know, that kind of went down. But on, on the back of that, I think what's really important is like for us at HQ, um, how important it is for us to really safeguard and manage um, and preserve the brand. And, you know, we were lucky that, you know, this the CrossFit evolved and grew out of this life changing experience that drove this crazy passion and growth. And our job is to make sure that we um, can, can preserve and accelerate that same, same type of passion and growth. And so we hear that often from affiliate owners, at, at, rightly so. Like, hey, we look to you guys to protect the brand, to preserve the brand, to evolve the brand. And we got to take that, that responsibility really seriously. So I had seen like different numbers regarding affiliates. So I'd love to understand from you if it's something you could share. Like basically affiliates were, you know, some 14,000 or something dropped to 9,000, but now it's recovering. Like just affiliates are such a big part of CrossFit. Yeah. Like where do those relationships stand uh, just from a numbers wise? And then even on a personable level, as you get out and talk to people and try to like, you know, make sure your community is, is where it needs to be. Where's the affiliate piece of that standing? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say, um, 
you know, if we look at the state of the affiliate community today, we have rebounded a ton from two really, really hard years. As you point to, our affiliate numbers dropped off for a variety of reasons. We're seeing them come back in a really strong sort of way um, with really strong growth. Um, what I will say, though, on the flip side of that is when we talk to affiliates, we can't rest on our laurels. We have to do a better job at HQ. Um, you know, they look to us, they pay this affiliation fee every year and we got to earn it. And so the biggest way we can earn it is by getting more people uh, to walk in the front door of their affiliate because they heard about CrossFits and the way they heard about CrossFit convinced them it could be for them. And we help every one of these tens of thousands now uh, of affiliates around the world uh, continue to grow and reach and impact more lives. So that's a huge part of, you know, a little bit of, I know I keep uh, beating the drum on this, but it's really clear what the most important work is that we need to do. And then the other piece is we've invested a lot. So, you know, CrossFit evolved really on as a, as a fairly hands-on, you know, affiliates, hey, pay your fee, do your thing. You have full autonomy. And there's a lot of that that made the CrossFit affiliation really attractive. Most franchises come with a ton of rules and a ton of things you can and can't do or things you must do. And most of our affiliate owners love the fact that they can have autonomy and run their business. At the same time, we've got to support them and make sure that, you know, we give them the resources and the information they need so they can run and build a really, really successful business. So we've invested more in our team. We've invested more in resources and making sure that if they need to talk to someone at HQ, they can do that. And then giving them the tools and resources they need um, to be able to run a really successful affiliate. What about uh, the sponsors? Because I know, like, for instance, Reebok was a, a big partner for a while. They're no longer with you all. But, you know, I had an unrelated call with some folks over at Trifecta recently, and they were telling me, oh, we just we just linked out with CrossFit. So, like, I don't have the, the perfect tally, but just, like, what's up? You lost some big people. Are you getting people back? Like, where do you all stand with sponsors? Yeah. So I'd say, you know, first sponsorships has been and will continue to be like a hugely important part of, of our business. And, you know, I'd say, you know, I think if you look at any major sports or community, you've got a natural evolution of sponsorships. Um, and, you know, some stick around for a long time. We have Rogue, who has been a huge partner for us since very, very early days. And then we've seen a really natural evolution of different partnerships. And I think, you know, if you look at, you know, we think about, um, you know, what we bring to the table, we want to create partnerships. The best partnership sponsorships are those where there's really, really strong brand alignment. Um, um, there's really strong set of kind of shared objectives. You know, we bring to the table this community of millions of extraordinarily passionate people who really think about CrossFit and health and wellness as fitness as a core part of their identity. Um, you know, people talk all the time about how passionate CrossFitters are and they reflect that and what they buy and what they wear and how they train and the gear that they use and the products that they consume and the brands they affiliate with. And so, um, you know, we think those millions of CrossFitters, the tens of thousands of small businesses is a really, really valuable asset for the right partner. And, you know, looking back, you know, look at the massive businesses that were born in and grew and scaled in the CrossFit community. Rogue, Noble, RX Bar, et cetera. And so for us, we're always looking for, you know, they'll, they'll be, you know, would expect, they'll be the set of partners that continue, you know, we have very long-term relationships with. And then hopefully there's a new set of partners like Trifecta, where we've got incredibly strong brand alignment, a really strong value proposition for our shared customers that we can kind of build and grow with as well. Yeah, I rock with Trifecta because when you're trying to like, you know, Kiko, my fitness pal, keep track of everything you're eating. It's like, this was my lunch laid out, know all my macros, <laughs> know my calories. Oh. So I think they do a good product over there, but like with them or anyone specifically, like anything that you could share about how you're working with other companies uh, that you're excited about or that, you know, you just think people should be aware of as you're like, you know, rebuilding relationships with external parties. Yeah, I, you know, I think for us, we are now in the phase of thinking about um, our, our next set of partnerships going into next year. So we had a great, this year was really successful for us, the games in particular. So the games is a really big moment for us and for our partners. And this was a really strong and successful year for us. As we think about moving forward, I think there's a couple of things I'd highlight. You know, we look at both, we have some really strong endemic, non-endemic partners, we think. 
will be an important part of our relationships moving forward. We're also thinking about um, one of the things that we're going to, you'll see us experiment with a bit more is uh, finding opportunities to work with partners um, where we've got some audience overlap, but where there's the opportunity for growth on both sides. So if we come back to that true north for us as a business, it's about reaching more people. And so increasingly, we're looking at partners, not only in terms of what things might look like from a sponsorship perspective and revenue perspective, but also, hey, how do we grow together? How do we find partners where, again, that audience overlap, we can bring them new audiences and new customers, and they can do the same for us with a shared message that um, has really, really strong brand alignment for both partners. So we're hustling really hard to kind of think about you know, what are the right types of relationships? We've got a bunch already that fit the mold and then hopefully some new ones going into next year that we're excited about. What is, I'd say in a way, like the best story that you've heard about CrossFit? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about this community and changing people's lives. Um, is there anything like just personal, someone that you ran across from being on the ground at a box or like, you know, you ever have a celebrity call up the company or have some type of request? Like what are some things that the average person might not be privy to that you have seen and said, okay, there's something special about this company? Yeah. You know, if, if we had more time, I'd take you through, it's honestly kind of the, I, I, I get the goosebumps when I think about it, the conversations that I've, I've been able to have. Uh, and it's not the celebrities candidly. It's great. We love it. If they do CrossFit, it's the everyday people who are struggling with something in their life who come up and say, I'd love to tell you about how CrossFit changed my life. And it sounds, uh, it sounds a little cliched, but I'll tell you, I've heard that statement hundreds of times unprompted from folks. So I'll tell you one, when I was at the games, we had a member of the community. Um, we were at an event that we were hosting for affiliates and we had a member of the community come up to me and he had his phone out and he said, Hey Don, I just, I, if you have a second, I'd just love to tell you what, what CrossFit did for me. And he showed a picture of him from a few years back when he weighed 485 pounds. And he said, I was, I was grossly overweight. Um, I had a substance abuse problem. Um, I couldn't hold down a job. I had mental health issues. And I was talking about doctors, you know, to my doctors about all of these clinical interventions, about going on these drugs or getting the surgery. And I was blessed to have somebody walk me into a CrossFit box. Um, I've lost 250 pounds. Um, my, I'm, I'm managing my abuse issues. I haven't had a drink. I haven't had an issue. Um, I've got a great job. I'm happier than I've been in a very long time. And I've got this network of friends and people who have helped me on the journey. And I got just goosebumps here on that story. And gosh, what a privilege, a privilege it is to get a chance to work on something that can touch people's lives like that. And, and again, I've heard hundreds of stories like that. And so that's the fuel when we talk internally, that's the fuel that drives us. That's the hustle. Like there are probably millions of people like this who are struggling with mental health issues, metabolic disease, substance abuse, et cetera, whose lives we know we can change. If we can convince them to give us a shot, to give this community a shot, we can forever impact their life. And gosh, what an amazing opportunity that is. So, um, yeah, that, that's one story and there, there are countless others. Yeah, I love that. I love, you know, talking to people who I think you get that extra dose of passion because of that type of impact, you know, something that you can measure out in the world, measure that impact on real lives. Um, and that's a beautiful story. But out of curiosity, um, you know, not not in any type of like shallow way, but like when I ask about celebrities or athletes or something, I think just maybe to understand about the reach with like some of the more powerful or more known people in society, are there, you know, anything cool when it comes to, you know, folks that we might know or admire publicly who you've had the opportunity to interact with or, you know, seen in a gym and just said, okay, wow. So like I'm, I'm changing this person's life. And then also this person whose art or music or whatever I love, I'm also seeing how it's impacting them. Yeah. So, um, and, and no question. And, uh, didn't mean to imply otherwise. Those folks are really important for us, especially, I think, you know, my hope is that, you know, these folks who um, who have some reach and influence, if we can work with them and they're comfortable sharing their story, that's a great way for us to reach other people. So this is something we're thinking hard about, um, you know, without violating any confidences. I guess, you know, one area that I would touch on. So 
Um, one of our one of our partners is is Noble, and Noble's focus has really you know an, again another brand that grew up in the CrossFit community, and they work with a ton of athletes, and their kind of focus is on training. So Noble's all about training, and you know we've always believed from the beginning CrossFit is about training for life. It, it is about being able to spend the time so that you can play with your kids and do all the things that you love. And what we're starting to see is more and more athletes, professional and elite athletes. Um, who do CrossFit to prepare for their sport. And so whether it's a Caleb Dressel um, in swimming who does a bunch of Olympic weightlifting um, or golfers, pro golfers who are doing it um, or football players, um, there's a lot of really interesting and exciting stories there. And as we think about for us, opportunities for growth, cases where you've got elite athletes who are using CrossFit as a means of training for their sport to build the type of resilience and fitness necessary that they can succeed on the field or the court. So speaking of athletes, you, I know you called yourself a mediocre one, but I don't know, all American rugby player. Is that you, you're mediocre and you get the all American tag? Um, well, yeah, I was, uh, you know, again, kind of right place at the right time and, and uh, probably more a reflection of the state of U.S. collegiate rugby back in 1998 than, than anything else. Right. No, I, I appreciate the humility. It's actually really fascinating, especially both of us on the West Coast. You see all this investment in rugby. That's like going, I think the World Cup, yeah. the men's and women's are coming in like 2030 or 2033. Um, both, I'm really fascinated in how rugby and cricket are going to evolve, let's say, over like the next 20 years because they're they're so popular globally. Um, and, you know, I'm starting to see like more investment in the venues and more investment in the teams that are coming, you know, owners who maybe aren't going to buy an NFL team, but they'll buy a rugby team. Like all these little things are starting to snowball. But like, what did you enjoy about rugby culture? Do you still play? Like, what does it mean to to your life? Because at the end of the day, it's always going to be on your resume next to the schools and to the tech companies. Oh. So what does rugby mean to you? Yeah, you know, a, a big part of, you know, why rugby has been, it will always be really special to me, is it was this moment where I went from being, you know, growing up, being a aspiring to be a good athlete. But candidly, like for me growing up in high school, like I played football, basketball, baseball, and I really was, I was like very average, had really wanted to be a good athlete. I had this chip on my shoulder, but um you know, knew in high school, I was never going to play any of those sports at the collegiate level and then got to the Naval Academy. And I just was super blessed. I had uh, an upperclassman, you know, I was a freshman. So when you're a freshman at the Naval Academy, basically everyone tells you what to do. And this guy come in, came in my room and said, Hey, you know, what sport are you playing? I said, nothing. And he said, well, you're playing rugby now. And, um, I fell in love with it. And, you know, I think Part of it was probably I was a little bit of a late bloomer athletically. Part of it was probably just the, the nature of, of rugby in the game. Um, but um, absolutely loved the sport. Played for four years at Navy. We had a really good team there. So we played, you know, national championship my junior, senior year. Um, and I loved both the, the nature of the sport itself. And I think there are a lot of things. I'm, I'm bullish about rugby in the U.S. because I think the American sports viewer – um, I think loves a lot. I think there's a lot of things about the, the game, the pace, um, the aggressiveness uh, of it that I think the dynamic nature of sport that, that Americans will really love. And so I'm bullish on it. All those things I fell in love with. And then just as important, honestly, is just the, the social element of rugby is really unique. You know, in college, we would, our team was really tight, um, but we'd also, we'd go beat the heck out of our opponents on the field. And then really in common in rugby is when that final whistle blows, you're out to the bar and you're having a drink with the people who you just spent the previous hour and a half, you know, knocking down into the dirt. And there was this community elements within rugby that was and is really, really strong. And I love that. I loved being able to compete all out. And then after the game, immediately, you were part of something that was bigger. Um, that culture that exists, I think, was really, really dynamic. So. I played for four years. I played for about a year and a half after college in San Diego. And then unfortunately, I just kept getting injured. I blew out a shoulder. Um, I broke a bunch of bones. And and uh, and then the, the, the uh, demands of kind of active duty military time made it really hard to continue to play at that level. So mostly now I just watch it on TV and, and hope maybe someday one of my uh, daughters will play. 
Yeah, well, a lot of opportunity coming up, like we said, with the way it's growing you know, globally and, and definitely in the States. Anything else that you have a bit of that personal passion for, like, you know, between music, film or art or, you know, what have you, when you're not focused on CrossFit or, yeah. you know, just your own fitness or watching rugby, like anything else that has your heart? Yeah. You know, I, I mentioned it before, but you know, I've got three little girls and, uh, so, uh, and they're at a stage now where they're just starting to get exposed to sports and I'm trying not to be the obsessive parent who gets too excited or too, uh, uh, over the top, but, but absolutely love that. So most of our weekends now are spent watching soccer games. Um, I love, I love reading. I've, I've had, I was super blessed growing up. My parents exposed me to reading in books early on. And so I'm, a an obsessive reader, fiction, nonfiction. Um, that's, you know, definitely a big part of my life. Well, tell me, uh, tell me a, a life changing. I'm, I'm a big literature reading guy. Like what's a, what's a book or two that you'd recommend to everyone or that just like changed your life? I love, um, so some top books I'm, I'm, Probably predominantly, my favorite books are probably fiction. Same. Uh, By the, the way, book. can we can we just rep for the fiction gang out here? Because I feel like everyone yeah. grows up and they act like fiction is just like for high school English class, and now you have to read all the nonfiction history books. And trust me, I love those. I love I love history. I love learning about what happened in this world. But something about that escape in fiction should never be underrated. 100%. Yeah, and you can learn. Yeah, you can learn so much totally. about the real world. It's not just like fantasy land. So let's just let's, let's talk fiction. What are your favorite novels? So I'd say my probably top novels slash authors. I love Pat Conroy is probably my favorite author. So Great Santini, Prince of Tides, uh, just a beautiful writer. Uh, mostly writes about dysfunctional Southern families. But um, gosh, the guy has just such a way with words. Um, love a book called Shantaram. Um, I forget who the author is, but phenomenal book, book called Cutting for Stone by a guy named Abraham, Abraham Bergese. Um, uh, incredible. Um, let's see. What are some of the other top ones for me? Um, John Irving, big John Irving fan. A lot of his early work I'm a huge fan of. Um, and then I like to mix in, candidly, I like to mix in some kind of faster pace don't, you know, I can turn my brain off and just enjoy it. So I loved early when I was, you know, probably 15 years ago, I read all the Michael Creighton. I love that uh, type of stuff. Uh, I love the Harry Bosch trilogy, Michael Connolly. I've read all of those. Uh, so yeah, I could go on and on. Yeah, but, no, uh, prop, props for you for keeping, uh, you know, reading at the forefront. I think like, it's very easy to fall off of reading, but when you're in a groove and you're reading, you're like, how have I ever gone a month without reading a book or something? You know, it's like, it feels totally. so good when you do it. Totally yeah. agree. Totally agree. Nice. Well, um, I just got a couple other things here as we're, as we're wrapping up and I, and I really do appreciate the time. Uh, I think if we bring it back to CrossFit and fitness and, and, and all of that, um, I want to understand your perspective on the mental aspect. I know like Eric Rosa, who's a chairman and I know handed the reins to you is really big on this. He's been honest about some of his personal, you know, challenges. Um, and it's something I can relate to. It's something, it's such a prevalent conversation because it's, it's like, it's always been huge. Now we're just, we're being more open and honest about it. And um, I think, I think this is a good opportunity to just like, connect with people we all know like we want to look good right we want to be at our optimal peak physical selves uh, you know the best that we can um, but what have you found in your life because it's like kind of a highlight reel you know like if you're looking at it from the outside he's he was in the marines and he's at stanford and he's at google now he's the ceo i mean it's all these things but like you know without uh, I, I promise i'm not trying to like be your therapist here but i would love to hear about like the, the mental challenges that someone with like, you know, all these different things they're doing in their life. And clearly you're a busy guy. And there's a lot of pressure and just like how you handle that, how stuff like CrossFit and just like being in touch with, uh, with your fitness helps you mentally, helps you stay sharp. Yeah, no question. It, it, uh, you know, my wife and I, so my wife was a uh, collegiate athletes. So we are both very into fitness. Um, and we do our best to kind of make sure that we create time and space for it in our lives and expose our kids to it. Uh, but we talk all the time, we kind of half joke, but not really that we don't want to be around each other if we haven't had a chance to work out for a few days. And 
you know, fitness for us is both, um, you know, there, there's a bunch of, of research that shows the link between, um, you know, training and physical fitness and mental health and wellness. You know, you get the endorphins, um, uh, just overall uh, physical health, uh, fitness and, and, uh, and health being so, so, so important. And so, um, you know, for us, it has been, we've, we've tried to work really, really hard to make it a priority. And, you know, we, have been, there's no question, you know, I've been, my wife and I both, we've been so blessed. You know, we say all the time, like most days we wake up and we've won the lottery yet again. We have an amazing family and we've had incredible opportunities and we were born in amazing places and, and all that. But we've also had, you know, lots of moments that were really hard. We had some health stuff and we had some, you know, work stuff. My last company was amazing, but we really struggled. It was really, really hard and really stressful. And, worrying about whether we're going to make it or going out of business and fitness has always been a place where we could invest in ourselves a little bit and, and know that if we could get an hour and we could work hard, then we could face the rest of the day. We could face whatever was going on in our life um, with a little bit more fortitude um, and with a little bit more confidence. And, um, and so that's, you know, for us, so important. And again, for all the people who haven't had a chance to experience that, um, you know, I, 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 I told my wife and I've shared a few other folks, one of the happiest moments for me, you know, we've spent much of humanity has spent the last two years dealing with this pandemic where a lot of these social experiences that all of us need and have been accustomed to or shut off all of a sudden. And we spent more time staring at a screen or sitting by ourselves at home. And that has had a huge, we know this, it's had a huge impact on mental health and wellness. And, you know, I remember one of my happiest moments in the last two years was the day that I, you know, got a chance to go back to the gym. And I remember I, I did a workout and I'd wear a mask. It was miserable. It was terrible. And I remember walking out there and getting a chance to see my friends I hadn't seen in a long time and get a great workout where I worked harder than I had in a year and a half because of the social environment. And I remember getting in my car and calling my wife and just saying, I'm so happy right now. And so, um, you know, that gives us more, that gives me more fuel for what we're doing. There's a lot of people out there that are still struggling with it. And if we can make that fitness journey, that experience a little bit easier for folks, um, cause it can be intimidating. It can be hard, but if you can make that community dynamic and you can give them confidence they're going to get the return, gosh, what a big impact we could have. Right. And so you want to do that and then you want to do it with more people, right? We talked about broadening your horizons. Uh, and I understand after what CrossFit's been through over the past couple of years, you know, a big part of it is just enacting a mental uh, adjustment, right? Changing the culture. Um, but how do you actually get results? How do you actually create a more diverse company and community, whether that's in the building at HQ or that's at all the affiliates and the boxes across the world? Yeah. So, um, you know, and you touched on this well, there are, um, you know, I think we have some things that are going for us and then we have some real meaningful challenges that we need to address and figure out. I think the thing we have going for us again is that, you know, we have this community that I think you know, by and large, the vast majority is incredibly welcoming. So if we can just get people in the door, in 99% of cases, they're welcomed and embraced with open arms. The challenge is there's a lot of folks out there who look and say, it's not for me. And, and that's reflected in um, the number of people we can reach. And, and so um, for us, it's going to start internally. And so we have an amazing culture at HQ, but we need to make sure that we have on our team the diversity of perspective and experience um, to ensure that we can understand all the folks who are trying to reach and really create experiences for them, reach them with a message that's really going to resonate. Uh, and, and so that, that'll be a big focus for us um, uh, and has been, but we'll continue to build on that next year. And then the second piece is, is in the way that we show up, um, you know, we are, we've got to make sure that as we are telling our story externally, again, we figure out a way to tell the story in a way that's going to resonate with everyone. Um, and again, no matter who you are, where you come from, where you live, um, we've got to make CrossFit something that's approachable. Um, and so a lot of that's going to be how we show up and tell those stories and candidly, our ability to do that well, I think has to start with us doing our job internally and making sure we have to kind of write people around the table to go do the work. So, and last thing I'll say on this front is, um, 
you know, this stuff is um, of paramount importance for us because it is necessary if we're going to achieve what we hope to, which is, you know, we look out and say, we really, really deeply believe that CrossFit's for anyone, anyone, anyone who's willing to work hard, anyone who wants to get fitter. And if we're going to actually realize that, and you look at our community in eight years and, and it looks reflective of being anyone being able to approach it, then we've got to figure out how we reach those audiences that today we haven't quite yet. So um, it's part and parcel to the work that we're doing on the growth side to make sure that we do a better job of reaching folks, understanding where they're coming from um, so we can get them in the door. Then when you put all this together, getting more people, reaching more people, growing a community, um, all of it in some ways, look, we're all in business. It's about, it's about making more money in a way. Like I, I think, I think a company can be totally sincere about the fact that it wants to help more people, but also with that comes more revenue, comes an increased valuation. You know, CrossFit is not, you're not here to make it a smaller company that's, that has less revenue. Right. And so, um, what, where do you stand in terms of revenue, in terms of valuation, in terms of like the size of the company on paper and, and where it needs to be at in 2030, you know, do you have, do you have a, a, a North star number? Hey, we're going to be a $10 billion type. Like, I don't, I don't know. Cause I'm not in the office, but if you could quantify that and take us home as a business, you know, as a business publication, business podcast, I think people, I uh, would love to know that side of it too. Sure. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, and you're right. And, and look, let, you know, the way that I think about this in terms of um, uh, what we focus on, what success looks like, the absolutely, we want to build a really compelling, successful business. And the best way for us to do that is focus on getting more people exposed to CrossFit. You know, we are a, um, and the reason we talk with that and the reason we lead with that is that's what gets all of us excited. Do I want to build a successful business? Yes. But I get a lot more excited candidly about building something that can be the biggest force in improving um, health globally. And I think we have a shot at being in that ballpark. And if we do that, holy cow, this is going to be an extraordinarily successful business. No question. Um, you know, what does that look like in terms of numbers? Look, we don't, we don't share our, our kind of revenue and internals right now. But what I'll say is, you know, today, if you look at external estimates, this is a multi-billion dollar ecosystem today. Um, we should be an order of magnitude. It can be an order of magnitude larger than that in seven, eight years for the overall ecosystem. And then our ability, is, or sorry, for us, we should take a reasonable share of that um, as CrossFit. And then a huge share of that, much bigger share should go to affiliates. Big share of that should go to our sponsors and partners who are helping build and grow it. And so that's what we're really focused on. It's not just us. It's how do we grow the overall pie and put ourselves in a position where we are creating undeniable value for CrossFitters, for affiliates, and for sponsors. If we do that, this would be a great business. All right. Well, Don, thanks for your time and good luck in your new position. Thanks so much, Ernest. Really appreciate it. And I'll get down, when I get down to LA, will we get a workout in? Hit me up. I There's right. one right by the crib. So you come over... You know, you come in, meet the crew, and then say, uh, make sure that this guy can make it home after this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We'll do it. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Don. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Don Fall for coming out and telling us all those great stories about his career and CrossFit. And I'm really curious to see where he's going to take that company over the coming years. We'll be back next Wednesday with another guest as always. I hope you've been enjoying the show so far. Remember, go to Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. Drop us a review. Leave those five stars. Every little bit counts. While you're doing that, I'm going to get out of here. I'll see you soon.